I hope you can all bear with me. Um, but so yes, as the seed bank coordinator, I know y'all have had a lot of um, talks recently and some coming up in the future about seeds. And so I, I don't, I didn't really know what else to talk about. I didn't want to inundate you with seed stuff. So I thought I would just give a couple updates, um, some history on the work that we do at the Wildflower Center, um, our priorities as a science and conservation team, and um, kind of highlight a couple of cool species that we're hoping to work with in this next year. Um, so if that sounds good to you guys, I'll go ahead and start with what is a seed bank. So I'm sure most of y'all probably are familiar with seed banks, um, but I get a lot of questions about it. So I thought it would just make sense to kind of start off explaining kind of what we do. So seed banks are just facilities for storing seeds in a controlled environment for um, long-term use or um, long-term storage that is. And there are a lot of different types of seed banks. I think probably some of the most famous ones that you've all heard of, um, they really conserve like crop seeds and that is for an event of like mass destruction or a crop failure or something like that. Um, the USDA has a really big seed bank in Fort Collins and um, I'm sure y'all are all familiar with the seed vault in Sweden, which is just like built into um, the ice essentially. Um, but depending on how long you're storing your seeds for and the purposes, um, the process of maintaining and facilitating your seed bank kind of differs. Um, but really it's just a place to um, preserve seeds and keep them for growers or um, research needs, conservation needs, stuff like that. So a little bit um, of some history for the Wildflower Center Seed Bank. So we um, really started our seed bank in 2000 with partnership with the Millennium Seed Bank and the Seeds of Success. Um, so we, the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center was the first non-governmental agency to partner in this endeavor, and they had the goal of conserving 10% of the world's dryland flora um, by 2010, and they succeeded in that goal, and they're still, um, they, they have new goals set for, I believe their um, new timeline was for 2020, but I'm, I'm sure things kind of got slowed down during the pandemic and everything. So they're still working on reaching that goal, but we aren't a part of that anymore. Um, basically we had some lack of funding and some leadership changes. And so our conservation team or our conservation programs kind of um, just dwindled out a little bit, but we still kept up with all of our um, seed accessions from the Millennium Seed Bank endeavors. But in 2021, Dr. Sean Griffin was hired as our science and conservation director and he really um, situated us to kind of ramp back up our seed banking process um, and programs. So we, by doing that, we um, really increased our involvement with the Center for Plant Conservation or CPC. So that's just like a national organization of conservation professionals, botanic gardens across America. And we all just work to like share resources and best practices. Um, and majority of our seed collections from the past year have been in partnership with Williamson County's native plant rescues. So Ashley Landry, who I believe is speaking to y'all in a few months, um, she is just a great human and so so knowledgeable in all this stuff. And she, um, luckily we were got in contact and we were able to um, help with some of her plant rescues. Um, she would find some cool species. If we didn't have them in the seed bank, she would let us know but they were available and I would go out and help um, on those rescues. Um, so that's where majority of our collections come from in the past year, but we're trying to shift our focus away more from common species and more into species of greatest conservation need or SGCNs. I might have SGCN on this PowerPoint later. And so that's what that means, just the species of greatest conservation need. Um, and I also have some resources at the end, which there's a really great tool on here from um, Texas Parks and Wildlife. It has its issues, but um, it's really awesome. You can just download um, a spreadsheet that kind of tells you all of the species in your area that are declining in population. Um, so I can talk a little bit more about that towards the end, but to get back to our history, um, in 2023, we were we got some funds to get a brand new freezer. So that's the bottom picture here. You can't really, 
So in the top picture, I'm sure y'all are familiar with Minette Marr. She was our conservation botanist who retired um, last April. And you can see she's kind of standing in front of what was our old freezer. And you can see like we're, we're packed for space in there. We have so many seed collections and um, things in jars, things in baskets. And so we really, with the expansion of our new team and increasing our seed collections, we really wanted to have more space so we can store more seeds. Um, and so that's the bottom picture is us in front of our brand new freezer. We were all super, super excited about it. It was the best day of our lives. Um, so with that, we'll have so much more space to expand and organize our collections. Um, and getting that new freezer led us to um, do an inventory of our entire collection. And we found that we have over 800 access accessions of 575 different species. Um, and 28 of those are species of greatest conservation need. So we have worked with rare plants um, over the period of time, but we're really trying to ramp that up more in the next coming years. But most of our collections, the 800 accessions of 575 different species um, were mostly collected, I think Cleon, you mentioned this, by um, Michael Eason from San Antonio and then Manette Marr up here. Um, they really just like crisscrossed the state and collected everything that they could. And now those are the bulk of our collections at the Wildflower Center. So conservation seed banking is a little bit different than just like regular horticulture seed banking. We do have um, a few refrigerators full of seeds that aren't part of our conservation collection. They're mostly for horticulture. So anything that they have collected from the garden that they wanna grow back out, um, they have access to those seeds, but they can also access our seed bank, but um, I'm getting a little off topic here. So seed banking for conservation, there are two major approaches. There's NC2 and XC2. So NC2 is protecting plants in their natural habitat, which is the probably the most important um, approach of conservation is like, we really, really wanna make sure that everything is, um, protected in the habitat that it naturally occurs in, but that's not always the case. Um, it's not always possible, especially in um, rescue situations like Ashley Landry really heads. Um, all of that is gonna be wiped out. And so it's not possible to protect those plants in their natural habitat. And so that's when we get to XC2 conservation, which is protecting plants outside of the natural habitat in seed banks or botanic gardens. Um, so they're more, of a cultivated, um, they're in a more cultivated environment so they can continue to grow there. Um, and this bottom point says XC2 conservation of wild plants is only appropriate for species that are threatened by extinction. So like, I, I just wanna reiterate the fact that our main effort is to protect plants in their natural habitat. And if we can't, then we will seed bank them. Um, but whenever we do seed bank, it is one of the most cost effective methods for XC2 plant conservation. It doesn't require a lot of resources and um, it's not super space intensive either. So it really is a great uh, method of conservation in those terms, but people have been seed baking forever. It's it's really not a new science, but it it is a pretty, I would say a lot of people don't pay attention to it. Um, and there are a lot of like things that can go wrong. Um, and so hopefully in our work, we can contribute more to um, the science behind storage behavior of seeds. But for our purposes, we're storing things at negative 20 degrees Celsius, because that is the temperature that is recommended to store things for a long period of time. If you're storing them for a short period of time for like immediate grow out or something, then you can store them at higher temperatures. Um, but it's really important to know the type of seed that you're dealing with before you bank it. And so there are three different types of seed. There's orthodox, recalcitrant, and intermediate. So orthodox is most seeds fall under the orthodox category, um, which means they are capable of being dried and frozen for long-term storage. Um, one of the main processes, or one of the main steps in seed banking is drying the seeds down because I'm sure this is like super self-explanatory, but it really took me a long time to like wrap my head around all of the different parts that go in to seed banking. Um, but whenever you, so we have to dry a seed down because if there's moisture in the seed and you put it in the freezer, then it will expand 
and then it will kill the seed and then it won't be viable if we ever wanted to pull it back out for a reintroduction purpose or if we're growing out in our gardens, anything like that. So um, it's really important that we know what kind of seed they are. So recalcitrant means it's intol intolerant of drying. So therefore it can't be seed banked. So things like acorns are recalcitrant. Um, they really need to store the moisture. And then intermediate kind of, it falls in between. So they can tolerate drying and freezing, but um, not for long-term purposes. So I do have some resources listed at the end too, to kind of help you determine if you're interested in seed banking yourself, it can really help you determine um, what type of seed you're dealing with. Like I said, most seeds are orthodox, but you never know. And there are a lot of, there's a lot of gaps in the information available. So any kind of work that you do, even if you find out that you, you know, weren't storing them properly because maybe it was an intermediate seed and you thought it was orthodox and you stored it for too long, that's that's great. It, it's terrible, but it's great information to know. Um, because there's a lot of gaps of information in the seed science world. Um, Jesse, so our, how do you dry yeah. the seeds? So we use um, a couple different methods. Um, historically, we use silica gel. So we would we have these desiccator boxes that are uh. um, they just like are they airtight boxes, and we put silica at the bottom, and then we have little meters that. Um, measure the moisture in there, um, which it's not it's not the best way and it's not super exact either, but there are um, there's ranges. So if you're storing it at like negative 20 degrees Celsius, you want to get your seeds to about 33 plus or minus 3% relative humidity. Um, but the problem with using, um, this is a really great question, but <laughs> the problem with using um, silica is that it's hard to monitor. So you have to make sure that it, you wanna like get it to 33 and then have it sit there. And so you have to like be really precise with the amount of silica that you're using and it can it can get kind of messy. And um, so we just actually are starting to experiment, experiment with some salts. Um, I think the salt that we're using is magnesium chloride hexahydrate, something like that. I'm not exact, don't quote me on that. I'm not exactly sure, but um, that helps you get a more precise relative humidity um, and it stays there. So it, it's a lot easier. We, we're still trying to um, perfect that technique, but there's other ways to do it too. I mean, you can just like lay them out on a drying rack, let them sit there. But um, we also have these tools where you can put a subsample of seeds in a thing called a hygrometer and it will measure the um, moisture content, and that is really probably the most um, effective way to at least measure um, the humidity in it is the hygrometer, but those are really expensive. So we just use um, little digital monitors right now to watch them, but hoping to really perfect our technique this year. Thanks. I hope that answers your question, yeah. Um, there's um, another question on the chat. Uh, in the picture of the old freezer, it looked like the seeds were in a variety of miscellaneous containers. Mm -hmm. Is there a specific requirement for the container used? So there are a lot of recommendations. Um, and I do have some more resources at the end that will kind of lay that out. So if you see, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but we have them in like mason jars and air yeah. tight containers in the front. Um, that is, I mean, it works. It's not the best. Um, because moisture can still get in there. Um, so I don't, you really can't see, but we have like little silica packets in here as well to kind of help okay. um, maintain the humidity in there. Um, but the best thing are these foil packets in the back. And so once they're dried down, then you'll heat seal them in a foil packet. So no moisture can um, get in. But I think we started using, we're, we're trying to transition all of our, um, collections that are in jars like this, we're trying to get them all back into foil packets because, I mean, it's they're airtight, but you know, you never know. And then they can break and that's just a huge mess that nobody wants to deal with. But um, the best, most preferred method would be these heat sailed um, foil packets back here in the back. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. And yeah, our, our, our operation is um, pretty DIY. I'm not sure if any of y'all were present 
um, at the tour last week. Um, but in this photo, the middle photo is just me and um, some our conservation collection manager and then some of our interns were all sitting around cleaning seeds. And this is our seed lab. So we just have like a various, all kinds of stuff in there um, to use to clean seeds and process our collections. We're, we're super DIY. I feel like that's really, um, that's really how most seed banks operate as I've learned as I've visited um, quite a few and talked to a lot of people in this world. It's just like, you really have to make do with what you got. And so I, I feel like we probably started storing things in these airtight jars because we had them on hand and it was probably the most useful at the time, but um, yeah, I think foil packets is probably best for long-term storing. Um, it doesn't matter as much if it's just for short-term. Um, but yeah, I think, yeah, I was here. So um, our seed bank is a um, conservation seed bank. Well, Okay, so this is this is where it gets a little tricky because we kind of have like a multi-pronged approach to this. Um, most of our collections are, were made, like I said, through the Millennium Seed Bank project, and all of those are for academic and research use, or um, in the event of like a population destruction. So if there is a conservation professional who's um, needing seeds to restore a population that was wiped out due to, I don't know, like development or extreme weather, anything like that. We give seeds for those purposes. And then also any researcher from across the world can reach out to us if they need um, a subsample of seeds for their work. Because like I said, there's not a ton of stuff published. And so we're always trying to increase the amount of information that's available um, in the conservation world. So that's like our main seed bank collection, the things that you see in the um, like foil packets, they're sealed away. We try not to open them as much as possible because every time we open it, that just, we have to go through the whole process again of drying them down and then um, re resealing, restoring. So we really try to not touch those seeds unless we absolutely have to. But then, um, like I mentioned, the collections that I made this year with Ashley Landry, in my head, we, we, they're all mostly common species. We haven't found anything super rare yet um, on those rescue collections. But in my head, I, I don't love the idea of just grabbing seeds from a population. They were doing totally fine in their habitat. Nothing was threatening them other than this like um, threat of development. And so it really just kind of broke my heart to think that we would collect these seeds and then they would just sit in the seed bank for however, who knows how long, when these are totally healthy, viable plants that could really help um, increase native habitats. And so we have another arm of our seed bank collection that um, we are, we give away more easily. So these are like non-threatened species and um, I want them to be back out into the wild like as soon as possible. So I, I call it like our pipeline collection because we're we're kind of just like trying to find we'll we'll house them, we'll process them, we'll clean them, and then I'm trying to find places for them to go um back into um wild habitats. And I have a little um link to that list that I can share with you guys at the end as well if y'all know of anybody who is doing any kind of like local restoration projects or like for example the UT micro farm on at UT campus, they were doing, they, they specialize mostly in crops and food sources, but um, they wanted to do a little prairie restoration project on their farm. And so we were able to donate like a huge sample of seeds to that endeavor. So if y'all know of anything like that, that's um, just like in your local communities, little projects and you need some more native seeds, um, please reach out to me. We would love to source some of our seeds to that. Um, and here's my email. I have it listed at the end as well with the list of all of our available seeds. Um, but yeah, so some of our, so I talked a little bit about our history and this is kind of where we're hoping to go in the future. So one of our main priorities is to improve our infrastructure. Um, I showed you a picture of our seed lab here and this is a, so as there's like, 
I don't know, six of us in this photo and it's like all of the space. You can't see this, but like on the end, there are like three more people back here and it's just so full. Um, nobody can really move around. If you want to access the sink, you have to like scooch behind everybody. It's it's kind of a mess and this is a shared space. I, I work in this space, um, my computer's there and then we have our science and conservation team go in there to process collections and it's also used by horticulture to do their seed cleaning. And so one of our main priorities is to improve that space so that everybody can use it like way more effectively because right now it's kind of like a shuffle between like who can use it when and um, where did this thing go and we need this and who put that where, you know? So we're really trying to improve our space to make it um, just like way more accessible, um, which will be huge when we do that. And then one of our other priorities is um, keeping better plant records. So we have all of the information on all of our collections, but they're just, none of it's really standardized. People are um, making collections and not reporting the same data across the board. And some things we know where they came from, some things it's kind of, we have to like go on a wild goose chase to figure out where they came from. So our conservation collections manager started in July and his main priority has been uploading all of our information into a database, which whenever that goes live, it'll be super helpful for us to track like everything that we do with each collection and like where things come from. And it's just gonna, it's gonna be, it's gonna be great. That's um, one of our huge priorities in the past year and, and this upcoming year. Um, another one that is really super exciting to me is um, we're hoping to begin a germination testing program for our um, seeds. So we applied for a grant and we're not sure, we haven't heard back yet if we got it, but that will help us fund a germination chamber so we can test um, a lot of our species all at once. Because like I said, our collections were made um, between, most of our collections were made, you know, over 10, 15 years ago. And just due to like lack of funding and lack of personnel, nobody was able to test those or even, like throughout this whole time they've been in the freezer, they've just kind of been there. And we're, sh like I said, there's not like a ton of information regarding like the best practices in storage um, and maintenance of seed collections. So our germination program will be huge to know, first of all, if our seeds are viable and if they're not, which I'm sure most of them are, I'm sure they're all fine because most of them are common species and they're all orthodox. and um, but they've been moved around a lot. We've changed freezers a lot of times. And so we just don't know. We don't know if our seeds um, will germinate. So having that information will be huge because if we have collections that weren't handled properly, then we can go back. We know we need to prioritize those for recollection. Um, and it'll really help us just build our program around what we know works best. Um, so if we get that grant, that'll be really, really exciting. and. Um, we're also working towards building collaborations with conservation partners in Texas. So that is the Texas Plant Conservation Alliance, um, which is the other aspect of my job. Um, and that is just a network of conservation professionals, horticulturalists, researchers, universities, botanic gardens, all of that, just a space for us to all kind of collaborate on what we're working on because Texas is huge. I'm sure y'all are all aware. Um, and there is a lot of work to be done in conservation in Texas. And there are a lot of like incredible people working on things. And just to get all those people, at least just have a platform where they can all communicate and um, work with each other. I think that is our main goal. And that's, that's not me saying that we need this. This has been an effort that people have been trying to um, produce since like the early 2000s, people have noticed this lack of communication between um, conservation partners. And so um, we're really, really trying to get that off the ground. There have been a lot of setbacks um, just due to like people not having the bandwidth to really get this thing going. And then also just having like bars on what they can do based on their current job titles. So it's it's been a whole thing and hopefully um, we can really set up a space where everybody can just collaborate together and streamline our work. Um, but then the most exciting thing 
of our priorities in this coming year is our work with these two beautiful species, Salvia pinstemonoides, a big red sage, and Quercus hinklii, or Hinkley's oak. Um, and so for the remainder of my talk, I'm just going to kind of dive into these species, which I'm sure y'all are all aware of most or both of these, but especially big red sage. So this plant, I have never come across a more beloved plant than big red sage. And it's just, I mean, look at it. Like it is, it's beautiful. Um, so it's ranking, uh, it's conservation rank is G1, S1. And so there's global ranking and state rankings. And so the first tier are the most threatened and critically endangered. And then it goes down to S2 and S3. And then anything that's like a four or five, those are just common species. They're not really threatened. Um, but big red sage is G1S1. And that is due to a lot of things, but it, a lot of it is probably due to the fact that it only grows in the Edwards Plateau region. It only occurs here. And I mean, I'm, I'm pretty new to this field, but right off the bat, like I learned that this plant, people just absolutely adore this plant. There are, I've heard so many stories. It was thought to be extinct. It was rediscovered. Like, I'm sure y'all, I'm, I'm sure people in this room probably have stories about big red sage, um, which I would love to hear them if you do have them. But, um, so we got a grant to start working on this species. Um, let me back up a little bit. Some of the, the main threats to the species are just human development and then like extreme weather cases. Um, as we all know, the Edwards Plateau Hill Country region is just rapidly developing. Um, we can all see it, we all feel it, and it's really um, harming the wild populations of these plants. And then um, the largest known population was wiped out in 1997 due to an extreme flood. So just as like this crazy weather keeps becoming more and more normal, the species is more and more threatened. So some of the work that we're hoping to do to preserve this species is seed collection, germination testing, horticulture grow out, and just more further research on it. Um, so these two pictures I have here are from a seed collecting trip out in Cibolo Bluffs in uh, Bernie, Texas. So um, this is a picture. <laughs> so this plant loves like rocky limestone soils it likes to be near water this is kind, this is a dried up creek bed but there used to be water running through here um and it likes like bluffs it likes to grow out of bluffs and stuff like that um so we came to um this place called Cibolo Bluffs which y'all might be familiar with um Bill Carr is a really noted botanist and he put out a really great piece about just Cibolo Bluffs as a place. It has so many endemic species growing on here. It is so cool. It's located off of a private property, but it's managed by the Nature Conservancy. And so um, this here is Clark on the left. He was our guide to help us um, locate the population of big red sage that was occurring here. And this is George Yatskovich from the UT Plant Resources Center or the herbarium on campus. And I don't know if you can see it, but he's holding a little sprig of big red sage right there, which is really cute. And so to access this population, you kind of had to like scale down the a wall. So it, it's on, okay, this is, can y'all see my cursor? I don't know if this is helpful, but I'm trying to like point out. Um, yeah, we can see here. it. Okay, cool. So the plants are all kind of like located down here. And I took this picture like standing on a ledge, same to right here. It's like, I'm on a ledge looking down on them and that's, you have to like scale the side of this bluff to like access this population. And as you can see on the other side here, it's like super steep. So it was really scary. Um, it wasn't that bad, it was, it was fine. But um, it was the most thrilling day, if not my life, then definitely my professional career. Um, but we actually got to, we visited this population and then we got to go back and um, do some seed collecting. And so, with rare plants, best practice is to collect seeds based on maternal line. And so for, for common species, you can just kind of bulk them all into one bag. It doesn't matter which plant you got them off of. You wanna spread out, but you can just kind of throw everything in one bag. For rare and endangered and threatened species, in order to properly study the genetic, genetic diversity, 
you want to keep each seed collection based on the mother plant that you're collecting off of. And so I'm sitting here with my clipboard. I have all these little tiny envelopes, like a pin in my mouth. Like I, I'm like trying to scale this bluff with like all this stuff in my hands. I'm trying to like count out the seeds because another best practice that I forgot to mention is for any species, you should not collect more than 10% unless it's like about to be completely wiped out. But especially for rare species, um, you do not want to collect more than 10% at all, if that, um, just because, like I said, in situ conservation is um, the best form of conservation. And so if you collect too much, then it's it's really good chance that the wild populations will be depleted eventually. Um, so I'm really, I'm sitting there on the side of a bluff trying to count out like how many available seeds there are, trying to do a mental math in my head about how many seeds I can take. And it's, it was crazy, um, but we're really, I'm hoping to do more of that next year. There's um, a couple different populations out at Lost Maples, and then uh, we're trying to scout for new populations as well. We have some on private properties that are about to be developed that we're trying to get in contact with. So. There's a lot of great work ahead of us um, for big red sage conservation. Um, and I know that this is like a super attractive garden plant. And I honestly, I think I saw Dawn on the call, not to call you out, but I, I'm sure you have way more knowledge on this than I do. Um, but there are like two schools of thought between growing out rare plants and rare um, for like home gardens. and in my head, it makes so much sense because it's such a beautiful plant. So many people love this plant so much. Like, why wouldn't we have them in the gardens? But then there's this other school of thought saying that it could decrease the genetic, the genetic diversity of wild populations and make it even more threatened and endangered. But there, there isn't any published studies that that actually happens for this specific species. So I don't know. Hopefully, our work can kind of help get more information on that, I guess. Um, I don't know if when we make these collections if they'll be sold in our um, plant sale, but um, we're definitely gonna have some more in our gardens. And I know that um, these plants can be available at native plant growers, but that's just something to keep in mind with rare plants. Um, there is a potential to decrease the genetic diversity, I guess. Um, but it, that that is a debate that I do not have enough information on, and I would love to open that up to this group too, if anybody has any thoughts on that. Um, but our next species is Quercus hinclei or Hinkley's oak. Um, um, so, Jesse? Yeah. There was a question from Leon. Um, let me see here. Oh, can you share the story of why Salvia pentstemonides, the big red sage, discovery from being almost from almost being thought of as extinct? Yeah, so um, there's a lot of different stories about rediscovery. I've heard I've heard a lot. So I would maybe talk to a more um, seasoned botanist about this, but I can give you kind of the the rundown. So it was thought to be extinct. Um, I want to say in the 80s. And then it, I don't remember who it was. There were people like writing down, it might have been in the same bluff that I showed you at Cibolo Creek. Um, but they were just they were botanizing um for something else. And they were they were going downstream and they were in a little boat. And then somebody kind of like saw it out of the corner of their eye. And they were like, there's no way, there's no way that that's that. And they took some pictures, they sent it out. Um and they got it identified and it, it was actually rediscovered. Um, I think this was, I think this was all in the eighties. So uh, ever since then, there, there's not a ton of known populations anymore, um, but it really did just disappear for a while. And maybe it didn't disappear. It, it is really subject to herbivory as well. Like deer love to munch on those little things like crazy. Um, uh. But so, and it's hard to tell it's big red sage just from the rosettes. If they don't have the blooms, it's really hard to distinguish it from other salvias. Um, so it could have been around. It was just maybe getting um, chomped before it was able to get to bloom for people to notice it. But and that's why this population at Cibolo Bluffs was so abundant because it was like in um, 
just like Cretaceous limestone. So deer couldn't really get in there. And it was like on the side of a cliff, obviously too. So it was really protected from people or not people, but deer and other animals um, kind of munching on it. But yeah, I would recommend reaching out to um, any of your like local seasoned botanists because I'm sure um, they all have so many more stories about Big Red Sage Rediscovery. I think Marshall Inquist was technically the one who um, was credited with um, rediscovering it. But then I've heard stories, I don't know, I don't want to get into the drama of it because it's not my story to tell, but I've heard a lot of people saying that maybe somebody else rediscovered it and then their herbarium records were burned and like some people thought they rediscovered it but they didn't get any credit for it so it, it, it gets kind of it gets kind of messy um but I think that is just like that's incredible to me that a plant can have like this much cultural history behind it and that's why I love it so much is just because like everybody has a story about it it's it's insane um I hope that was a satisfying answer to the rediscovery Actually, um, yeah that was a pretty good uh, uh, <laughs> a summary of kind of what I hear in the background too. And maybe uh, the last one I heard was a botanist, maybe the botanist you mentioned, saw a photo of someone just talking about that. And in the background, mm -hmm. he saw this plant. And he said, oh my God, where is that? I got to do more research. Who is yeah. that? you see that? So there's all kinds of cultural stories, but thank you very much, Jesse. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, if anybody else has any stories, I would love to hear them because I just, I'm like, I, I'm a communications person, obviously. So I think like, and being able to like tell stories of plants and interconnect people and places and the environment, that's I love that so much. So please do share if you have any more stories about it um uh, there's another question in the chat about mm -hmm. uh with so many sages how are you sure it's a big red sage uh does it have any distinguishing characteristics that we could be on the lookout for yeah so let's see um this bloom shape is really um significant to the big red sage and it also has this like really distinct it's called big red sage but it's, it's more purple in my opinion it's like a deep 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 burgundy um and it has this like bloom that is really reminiscent of a pinstamen so that's why it's salvia pinstamenoides because this like really distinctive shape here um and I'm, I'm sure there are way there are other defining factors but those are the two that i know off the top of my head if anybody else has any that they care to share i welcome that Um, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I'm just reading through the chat here. Um, so yeah, like I said, I'm not sure if we're planning to sell it in our native plant sale, but um, that is a thing that we have kind of been discussing. There are several people with different um, opinions on that. Um, but I think Don mentioned something here. Let's see. I agree. Yeah, I think having an existing cultivation would be better than not having big red sage at all. So I don't know. I encourage people to keep conversing on that. And um, I'm hoping that the Wildflower Center can um, do research to contribute to the knowledge that it's okay to grow rare plants in your gardens, um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm not the voice there. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to jump in real quick to Quercus hinclea. I don't have as much to say about this. Um, we haven't really started our work with this yet, um, and we're really not the, there are so many other botanic gardens and um, conservation conservation people, botanists who are doing a lot of like really, really cool in-depth work with this species. But um, let me just back it up. So the ranking for um, Quercus sinclei is G2S2, like I said. So it's a little bit uh, more common than a Salvia pinstamenoides type, but it is still federally listed as endangered. So it only occurs in West Texas and Presidio and Brewster County. 
Um, and then some of the main threats to it are limited water and herbivory on this one as well. Less so much development, but you know, that's always a possibility. Um, so yeah, this is, I think this is just the cutest little oak, as you can see here, like the leaves are so tiny. That's it for scale, like there's the acorn there. They're super, super tiny. I think um, we have one at the Wildflower Center. It's probably about 10, eight to 10 feet tall. And I know that San Antonio has some really nice specimens of this and I, I they're probably about 15 feet tall. So they can get pretty big in cultivation, but um, out in the wild populations, they're, they're more like a shrub. Um, so some conservation actions we're hoping to take for Quercus hinclei is acorn collection, population monitoring, our rate of grow out, and further research. So as I mentioned before, um, acorns are recalcitrant, so they can't be banked. So we're not going to be putting these in our seed bank, but um, our arboretum manager, Philip, has a ton of experience growing these out, just a ton of experiences with oaks in general. And so we're hoping that we can um, get some new acorns, collect some acorns, grow out some new plants, and kind of just have a nice um, collection of acorn producing plants for further research. If anybody um, in Texas or otherwise needs that material, we will have a source for them. Um, so we're also going to do some population monitoring. So this is, I didn't put captions on these, I'm so sorry. Um, this is the Solitario and Big Ben Ranch State Park. Um, which I think is just the coolest landmark probably in Texas. Um, but yeah, so the only, we, so I know our Perkins nuclei on site, and I'm almost positive that this, the ones in San Antonio, they're all from the same population in Shafter, Texas, which used to be on public land, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's on private land now. So it's a little bit harder to access, but it used to be super easy. And um, I think this is a picture of one of the shafter populations, but um, so there's not like a ton of genetic representation in botanic gardens in Texas because they're all kind of coming from the same place, but we do have access to a large population in the solitario um, and it's super rugged out there, but we're hoping to be able to go out there and kind of monitor um, the species, kind of see if, there's any threats to herbivory or from herbivory and trying to determine what that is, if there's a way to protect the plants from that, um, that doesn't disturb the natural habitat. Um, and like I said, we're gonna grow them out in our arboretum and then hopefully have enough to be able to share with other gardens. Um, and we are partnered, well, Philip has connections. Philip is our arboretum manager and he is connected with the Global Conservation Consortium for Oaks and so, they are doing like really, really, really cool testing of like genetics behind this plant, trying to see if it's hybridized or um, honestly so much stuff. It's like way above my head, but um, we're hoping to support them in that research um, however we can. So we're working closely with them to kind of see where the gaps are and figure out what we can do to um, help them with that because a lot of them aren't based in Texas. So it's a little bit easier for us to get out there and then also, we have some connections at Sol Ross State University, which is super close. So we're, we're really hoping to just kind of um, fill in the gaps where some really cool work is being done on this species. I don't know a ton about it, but um, I just know that like, look how tiny that is. It's, it's so cute. I love it. Okay. Yeah, um, I see there are several, several questions in the chat. If you could look at okay. them, please. Uh, For, from the biosphere that is the solitario, is that what we're referring to? Makes there's, sense. Yeah, I and mean, there's a couple after that, I think. Okay, so I I thought that everybody was familiar with the solitario, and I was just completely out of the loop. But um, people think that it is an impact crater. Um, however, it's it it was a volcano that was rising and then like collapsed in on itself before it was ever fully formed. So it's out um, in Big Bend Ranch State Park and it's just this like super rugged terrain. And these are all massive, I mean, mountainous type structures. And um, I think the reason why 
there are so many Quercus nuclei here is just because um, it is, you know, protected for a lot of animals can't reach it. Yeah, <laughs> almost a volcano. Um, but um, yeah, everybody thought it was, I mean, how cool if it was an impact crater, but I think it's almost cooler that it was almost a volcano in Texas. Isn't that crazy? Um, but yeah, so I think it's like really, really protected um, from herbivory in this area. Things can still get out there. And obviously we don't know a ton about it because I mean, people don't just like hang out here. It's really hard to get to. So we're hoping that we can um, at least visit, hopefully four times a year, kind of see what um, what makes it so conducive for Quercus sinclair to grow there. Um, but my, I think um, the general consensus is this, just that it's kind of like isolated in this way where it's really protected from um, things chewing on it. Um, but there is really limited water out here. So these plants, these plants are like shrubs, they're very low to the ground. Um, so they're not like the healthiest populations um, and they probably could have hybridized with something too. So we really don't know much about it, we're, but we're hoping that our work can um, kind of inform that more. Um, mm. That's a good point, Don. Yeah, elevation too. And I bet there are more in Mexico. Um, we, I think, found a lot of these um, just based off of herbarium records. So we don't have, like, obviously a ton of access to um, Mexico herbaria records. But I'm sure that there are a lot more. And then, you know, if we find more populations of it, maybe it's not as threatened as we think. And that's just something that, you know, we hope to contribute to. Um, but yeah, are there any more questions on that stuff? I don't think so. Okay, so these are the resources, and I realize that these are all hyperlinked. I can I can send this out if y'all are interested in any of these. Um, this is a seed information database. Uh, it's really cool. It just tells you. I guess maybe I can it and show you are y'all still seeing this my screen or did it no no okay let me try to... I, i'm still yeah, seeing we're seeing it. do you see the seed information database popped up yep. okay yes. cool. so let's let me just kind of i mean if this is probably not interesting to anybody but me but i just i really geek out over um this so here, you can just pull up, like, they don't have every species that you could possibly think of, but they have a ton. And so, um, like, I don't think they have consuminoides on here. Let's see. No, they don't. But they do have a ton. And so it tells you um, this one has seed weight info. I don't know what you would need that for, but, I mean, if you ever wanted to know it, you have it right here. Um, this one has storage info. Okay, so it says it's orthodox. And it also tells you the weight of the seed. So uh, if you're ever curious about like how long you can store something, if you can even store it, this is a really great um, source for that. And then let's see. This is our test. It's the Texas Parks and Wildlife Species of Greatest Conservation Need list. Um, it can be kind of clunky and I'm not sure the last time it was updated. Um, and like I said, mentioned with the Quercus hinclei, like if we find more species elsewhere, that might affect its ranking. And so I'm not sure when the last surveys were done for this test. And so there are some things that are on there that I've talked to people and they're like, how is this listed? Like it's everywhere here. Um, so I would I take, take this with a grain of salt. But I do think it is like a really, really cool tool to use. Um, and it tells you like all of the species, like if you're super interested in mammals or amphibians or anything like that, like you can really um, um, filter by your county and see which species occur there that are um, decline, declining. Um, and then of course, Native Plants in North America database um, housed by the Wildflower Center it has a lot of really great information, but I know the Native Plant Society also has a very similar database, and I've heard 
incredible things on. So, um, but Nipona is getting an upgrade soon. So I just like to link this here to represent the Wildflower Center. The Society's Native Plant Database is more done to support our programs around landscaping with native plants, as mm -hmm. well as our uh, Natives Improve and Conserve the Environment Plant Partners uh, program. Mm -hmm. So uh, it is not meant to be an exhaustive um, database. Like well, in that case, others are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, Nepona, it, it, it doesn't have everything, obviously, but it, it has a ton of different lists. And it's really cool. You can like filter by your light requirements and where you're at. Um, if you're looking for native plants, say somewhere outside of Texas, it has all of that too. So um, if you haven't played around on there, some of the information is outdated and we, we get a lot of um, edits sent in too, like people will, will find mistakes. So it's it's not perfect, obviously. Um, but it is, I find it really helpful in my work and I have heard a lot of other people say they use it a lot. So I just like to plug it on um, as much as I can. And then this is the Millennium Seed Bank technical information sheets. Um, so if you're ever interested in like any of the processes that go behind seed banking, um, this kind of just like really lays it out for you, like step by step. Let's see. So you can like see some seed collecting techniques. There's just these like really great comprehensive handouts and they're all just right here at your fingertips. And this is from the Millennium, the Millennium Seed Bank. So a super well-renowned um, seed bank. Also, I learned about this today, but they have a really, really cool online resource where you can like tour their facilities, which I thought was really awesome. So if you're ever just poking around the internet and want to take a little walking tour of the Millennium Seed Bank, you can do that. Um, oh, and then also here's the seed information database. So yeah, this is, I just think I refer to these all the time, um, like drying methods. And we got a question about that. Let's see what it says. I'm probably way over time. This was not part of my presentation. Um, Y'all, y'all, I think y'all get the idea that this is just a fun resource. And if any of if anybody is interested um, in any of these, just just shoot me an email. I can send you the links to these. Um, but this is my rescue seed collection list, which um, if y'all want to scan that, or I can also send you a link if you're interested. There's my email. But these are just the common species that I um, was lucky enough to collect with Ashley um, on some of her rescues. So we like to use these for just local community conservation projects. If you know of anybody, any student projects or anything in your local area where you just want some more native seeds to kind of um, help develop that habitat, um, we would love to share some seeds with you. So yeah, I'll check the chat to see if there's any questions. Um, yes, we do have um, Bracted Swiss Flower. Um, we did a really big rescue a few years ago. We have a ton of seeds of this actually, which is kind of funny. Um, and we actually just got in contact with somebody who does a lot of propagation of bracted twist flower. So we're, we're hoping to share some seeds with them and um, learn more about our collection because there's another one of those things that have just been kind of sitting in our freezer. We're not entirely sure if they're still viable or, um, <laughs> what what the plan is for those but they're I mean it's such a beautiful species we want to use it and we um, want it in our garden so we're going to start working with that soon too but I know that Manette Mar really um, had a huge practice with flower project a few years ago um, and we do have a lot of seeds hey Jesse if you don't mind uh, if it's easy you can drop a few of those links in the chat otherwise you yeah. can send them all to me and I can distribute them to the whole chapter like everyone who got tonight's meeting request yeah why don't I just send them to you Sarah because I I don't know if the chat will disappear afterwards but I can send you um all of those links for you to distribute if that works better cool and awesome. for everybody on the call um be looking for that in your email Cool. Um, that's really all I have. Um, plant sales. Um, what what kind of species would you like to collaborate on? Marion, you can unmute yourself. 
but uh, everyone should keep in mind that our chapter has a permit to sell plants. We do not have a permit for propagation. Um, so that is not a chapter activity. Uh, we do accept donations from members of plants and don't ask too many questions, but um, but it's definitely not a chapter activity. Um, I will say that something in the conservation world that kind of doesn't always make a ton of sense to me is whenever you're testing, like during germination testing, a lot of the times you'll just wait to see if like one leaf pops up and then they'll just discard that collection and just check it off as viable and that breaks my heart into a billion pieces and so I'm trying to figure out a way where we can when we ger we do germination testing we can grow those plants out um so if there's an opportunity for somebody to maybe you know want to take those off of our hands and propagate them further um I would love to connect on that too so we don't just throw away baby seeds for no reason in the name of science. <laughs> Does that answer your question, Marianne, maybe a little bit? Yes, Donald has a license. It's not hard to get. If anybody's interested in individually having it, all you really need is an address and $130 and be willing to be open to inspection um, what, at least minimum of once a year. Anyway. Marion wants to know how we can contribute. What is the process? Um, well, I do know that there are um, a, a lot of efforts. So most of our seed collections come from wild collected populations. Um, it's hard to say no to seeds, it really is, but we can't take in every seed that people want to give us. Um, so like I said, most of our focus is on species of greatest conservation need. Um, and like my partnership with Ashley and Williamson County, if she sees a species that um, she thinks might be threatened or endangered or is something that you know, she's like, this plant needs like proper conservation methods. If you come across something like that, um, we would love to help out in that way. If you collect seeds, we would love to provide space to store it for you. Um, or if you're trying to start a rescue in your own chapter, because I know that is an endeavor that a lot of different chapters are kind of um, starting right now. Um, if you would like the Wildflower Center to store some of the seeds for you, or if you want us to come out and help collect, um, we, we'd be happy to do that as well. But in terms of just like accepting seeds and propagating them, um, that would be something more for like the horticulture team because we don't necessarily have the bandwidth for that right now. We're trying to build our team and we're hiring some new people to um, help with conservation grow out, but um, really it's horticulture who does most of um, the growing and propagating for um, common seed species. So um, I would reach out to that team if you want to contribute seeds. But like I said, if there's um, any other ways that y'all would like to collaborate on like rare plant conservation, I'd be happy to discuss that. Wonderful. And a great presentation. Thank you.